Sri Lanka is on the brink. The country is broke and its people are struggling to buy basic goods they need to survive. Sri Lanka desperately needs an international bailout. But it's quite likely that things will get much worse before they get better. But how much worse? Hello, my name is Sridharan. Welcome to News9Live.com for an exclusive conversation with Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy, former governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He held that post between July 2016 and December 2019. And prior to that, he has also worked with Sri Lanka's Ministry of Finance and Planning as an advisor on macroeconomic issues and structural reforms. He has also been an advisor to Mr. Ranil Vikram Singhe when he was a prime minister 20 years ago. Now, of course, Mr. Vikram Singhe is the acting president of Sri Lanka. Dr. Kumaraswamy, warm welcome to News9Live.com. It's evident that Sri Lanka is faced with its worst economic crisis since its independence in 1948. Uh, what is your sense? Are things going to get a lot worse before they actually get better? Well, as you pointed out in your introduction, the situation is very dire in terms of the economic circumstances in Sri Lanka at the present time. Whether or not things will get worse, um, let me first say they're not going to get better very quickly, for sure. Uh, but have we reached the trough or do we have to go down further before we start coming up? The extent to which we need to go down further will depend to a significant extent on whether or not we are able to mobilize bridge financing mm -hmm. in the period between now and the finalization of the extended fund facility with the IMF. That could take anything between four to six months, hopefully. Uh, and so in this time, we need to get some financing. So we need to actually get through this period, um, get an IMF program as quickly as possible, get debt restructuring underway uh, as quickly as possible. Those two things we need to do quickly. And then uh, we have to give confidence to our development partners, to our friends, notably uh, India, Japan, and China, uh, to give us some bridging finance in the meantime. Right. But the fact both. remains, uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy, that there is absolutely no usable foreign exchange reserve with the central bank in Sri Lanka. And, and your uh, president has actually said that the country needs at least $5 billion uh, in the short term over the next six months to even meet basic import requirements like importing food, fuel, and, and other essential commodities for the people. So which is roughly $700 million a month that the country needs. Uh, where is that money going to come from? So at the moment, how we are trying to address it is to squeeze that requirement as much as possible. As I said, that comes at a price in terms of economic activity, in terms of employment. Um, so that, I think, and in terms of businesses, whether businesses stay afloat or not. Um, so if we are able to mobilize more bridge financing, and India has been extremely generous so far, uh, but you know, clearly it'd be good if we can get some other countries coming in as well. If we are able to achieve staff level agreement in the coming days, uh, hopefully, say, by the end of this month, then perhaps there'll be more countries willing to give us bridge financing, notably Japan and possibly China. Uh, so that's where we can get this bridge financing. But to do that, I think we would need to finalize the staff level agreement with the IMF, which may give countries greater confidence to extend the bridge financing to us, uh, because they would think that the you know, the chances of us getting out of this problem are enhanced if we are on an IMF program. Oh, Otherwise, absolutely. they may think they'll be caught up in an open-ended commitment. You know, right. which so now, speaking uh, of the IMF yeah. program, uh, obviously, the first thing Sri Lanka needs to do is to get to some sort of a sustainable debt situation, which means it has to take care of the ex existing debt that it has from different countries. Otherwise, the IMF is not going to lend to the country. So what is the yes. country doing in terms of uh, restructuring the existing debt, which it has with countries like China, uh, with India and some of the countries? What is it doing on that front? And, and when okay. do you see an IMF deal actually falling into place? Okay. So on, on, as far as the negotiations with the IMF are concerned, we need to differentiate two things. The first is a staff level agreement between the Sri Lankan authorities and the IMF staff. Right. And then subsequently, 
the executive board approving the arrangement, which is when the money will actually be triggered. But once you get to a staff level agreement, possibilities open up in terms, hopefully, of attracting, the confidence will go up, possibilities of attracting perhaps um, more exporter conver conversions, of more remittances coming through formal channels, of portfolio capital perhaps coming into our share market, which is now very attractive, um, into our government securities market, interest rates are now close to 30%. So that those kind of inflows could come in with a staff level agreement, which won't resolve the problem, but it will give a little bit of oxygen to the system. So, and also it will give uh, countries, our friendly countries, more confidence to provide bridging finance, as I said earlier. So that is, that's the first piece. Uh, then in that time, once, uh, while we are at, uh, negotiating staff level agreement and immediate, the period immediately after that, we have, the government has now appointed some debt advisors. Uh, they've appointed a financial advisor, Lazar, and a legal advisor, Clifford Chance. Mm -hmm. And they are in the process of putting together a template in terms of how Sri Lanka can achieve debt sustainability. Right. The IMF would initially set out certain targets which we need to achieve in terms of key metrics. Key metrics like debt to GDP, external financing, gross financing needs, etc. Those metrics would be laid out by the IMF. And then the, the debt advisors would recommend how Sri Lanka can achieve those uh, targets. But I must tell you that achieving those targets is not going to be easy. Exactly. It's going to you know, require some hard, tough action right. on the part of the authority. So what is the time frame targets. we're looking at, Dr. Kumar Swami, in terms of something concrete falling into place as far as IMF bailout package is concerned? Okay, so provided we get a stable government in a matter of days, uh, uh, you know, at least we have an outcome to the mm -hmm. political uh, hiatus that we are having at the moment. Uh, 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 in a matter of days, it is not difficult to, from what I understand, mm -hmm. it won't be difficult to achieve staff level agreement in a week or two, or maybe even faster. There are just a few issues that are outstanding, but those issues require political guidance. So we need to have uh, uh, at least a finance minister in place uh, for those uh, decisions to be made. That's right, for someone to because talk to. <laughs> exactly, and also somebody to take the decisions particularly regarding fiscal measures. The central bank measures are now, I think, pretty much agreed. But the fiscal measures, clearly given the parliamentary oversight over public finance, mm -hmm. you require a, a, a minister in place uh, to take some of those decisions. So if those are taken, uh, I think hopefully, hopefully by the end of this month, uh, or you know, one could have a staff level agreement. Right. But this uh, is but not then, the first and, time. And that, yeah, then, then you have to do the debt negotiations. Once there is a staff level agreement and the, the debt, debt advisors come up with a template uh, and once the government and the IMF are happy uh, that the template is something that is doable, then the debt advisors will go to the creditors and try to sell the, sell the package to them. Right. Okay. The bilateral creditors and the commercial. Right. But Dr. Kumar Swami, this is not the first time that Sri Lanka uh, will be going to the IMF. It has a history of going repeatedly to the IMF uh, for bailouts. What is going to be different about uh, the bailout this time? So, yeah, we've had, I think, 16 programs uh, with the IMF so far. Uh, and really from almost the time of independence, we have the economy has been subject to macroeconomic stress. And the primary causal factor, in my view, has been the government's budgetary operations. Uh, we've had persistent fiscal deficits, you know, which have pumped excess demand into the system, fueled inflation. Um, some of the excess demand leaks into imports, and we have balance of payments problems, and that puts pressure on the currency. And so there is this repeating cycle. And so each time the, the, the economy, um, where the, when the imbalances uh, get um, uh, difficult, we, we go to the IMF, right? right? And we go to the IMF and we uh, get an adjustment package that is supported by the IMF and by donors behind the IMF. And we do the macro kind of stabilization for a period 
and make some progress. But then as soon as elections approach, that discipline goes. Right. So the macro slips and we have not been good at doing the structural reform to transform the economy and make it more resilient. Right. So you have these repeating stop go cycles, which are often quite closely correlated with the electoral cycle. Right. So that really is so the crux of the problem, isn't it, with Sri Lanka? That government, stress. yes, government, successive governments have failed to address the structural issues that are present in Sri Lanka's economy. So can you identify these structural issues for us and why have governments after government failed to address these issues? Okay. So I would say, I would call, though, though fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal policy is a macroeconomic issue, I would say we have a structural problem in our, in our fiscal outturn, and that is a lack of revenue. Mm. At the moment, uh, revenue has gone down to about 8 9% of GDP. Our expenditure is some 19%, 20% of GDP. So we've had, for three successive years, double-digit budget. And historically, also, this problem has been there, particularly since, I would say, the late 90s or so. Mm. We've had difficulty in uh, having our revenue steadily declining. Um, so revenue enhancement-based fiscal consolidation, I would call it a structural problem because we need we, we need to resolve that one central right secondly we we know we are a twin deficit country right? a budget deficit and a uh, current account of the bank payments deficit so the budget deficit i've told you is revenue has been the main main problem usually mm -hmm. i mean we can improve the quality of, of expenditure but certainly revenue is a big then on the on the balance of payments side we have you know, uh, uh, we haven't been able to have export transformation. There are a number of reasons for that. There has been consistently an anti-export bias in our policy framework. The exchange rate has often been... We've had various para tariffs which have been there, mm -hmm. which have prevented us from entering global supply chain. The most dynamic component of the international trading system for the last 15, 20 years or more have been these cross-border supply chains. These production then. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put a parrot, you ex really exclude yourself from those supply chains because in modern uh, production networks, you bring in, uh, bring in uh, import, then you do your whatever your operation is, and then it goes out. So that uh, the, the differentiation between import and export is blurred in this this modern modern uh, production Absolutely. network. Yeah. And so if you put a paratariff in the middle, you become uncompetitive, right? And so you don't get to play. So we have had negligent penetration of global supply chain, which have been the most dynamic international trading system. So over the currency, you know, this anti-export bias uh, in, in terms of our paratariff and levels of protection, which have prevented us from, we have a very small domestic. Right. So if anything, the incentive should be selling in the global market, yes, not in, in the domestic market. Right. But we have consistently shifted uh, resources into the domestic market through our policy framework. So right. that is one of the reasons why we've had a persistent balance of payments problem. Right. No, of course, account. the fact so those that two Sri Lanka things did have money of its own has also meant right. that it had to look to other nations, particularly China of late, for critical investment. And, and I feel that Sri Lanka has been drinking this easy money Kool-Aid for of China for uh, quite too long, and 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 look at where it's landed uh, the country today. So, uh, what's your view on that? So, uh, let me say that we have been drinking easy money Kool-Aid for probably 40, 50 years, <laughs> because you know Sri Lanka was the second country after Chile to liberalize its economy in 1977, 78. Um, of the countries which went down the autarkic, you know, dirigist route. And so the traditional donors, and, and also we were a democracy, right? Chile was not a democracy. Right. Uh, so the fact that Sri Lanka was a democracy and it had a liberal economic policies incentivized the traditional donors to generously support Sri Lanka because they were very keen to show good development outcomes in a country with a liberal economy and a liberal polity. So we got all this foreign aid very easily. So that's the Kool-Aid we were drinking, right? And never did the tough things to 
get our economy more resilient, more competitive. And each time we got into trouble, we went to the IMF, and on the back of the IMF, we got concessional money. We were a low-income right. country at the time. Exactly. So we were bailed out with, lo with low-cost concessional foreign aid. Now, the last, now, what, since about 2010, I would say, 27 was our first international solving one. Then, you know, we graduated middle, middle income. income country states. Yes. So then, after that, we have been subject to the discipline of international capital markets and rating aid. And we didn't adjust to it. We continued in the same way and still live beyond our means, but we were no longer able to get bailed out with concessional. And with each round, things got more and more difficult. Right. And now it, we are in this situation. Right. So, you know, China, to some extent, obviously uh, gave you a lot of money and the money went into infrastructure rather than assets which could have actually been productive and tax generative for the economy. Uh, and now, uh, why is China reluctant to uh, actually help with uh, a further set of aids which would actually help stabilize the economy and maybe even simple things like, uh, you know, changing its terms of lending, which will allow the uh, central bank to use 1.5 billion from China, which is already sitting in its accounts. Uh, why isn't China yeah. helping uh, Sri Lanka even more? Okay, I, I mean, I should have said in my earlier answer, the previous answer, that the, the, the if there is a problem, it probably is more on our side, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the sense that we didn't screen our project effectively enough to ensure that the money we borrowed could either earn or save sufficient foreign exchange for us to be able to service that debt. Right. Right? So, I mean, we have to put our hand up. It's up to us to make sure that these projects are, uh, I mean, you can, there are all kinds of stories that the mm -hmm. projects uh, well, there, there were issues that affected the selection of the projects, etc. That's all that. But in the end, it's our responsibility, uh, which we didn't exercise prudently, in, and, uh, and you know, across the political uh, spectrum. So that's the problem. You know, that money we borrowed didn't generate enough uh, uh, saving or uh, earning of foreign exchange. So now, as as China, to be fair, did provide us with over a billion dollars of assistance during the pandemic. But, you know, my understanding of the Chinese mm -hmm. is that they're hard-nosed. So by the time, you know, the pandemic hit, and for various reasons it became clear that Sri Lanka was no longer creditworthy, I suspect they didn't think it was in their interest to throw good money after bad. So they have been reluctant. I think that's what I see as, as, as the issue now. But as... As the policy framework improves, I suspect China will uh, consider. China has been a consistently a, a friend of Sri Lanka, to be fair by them, over the years, ever since the rubber rice pact in the uh, 1950, early 50s. Uh, China has been very supportive of Sri Lanka. Yeah, but for good reason. Uh, it's, I wouldn't want to believe that it's entirely out of goodness of their heart that they've been uh, funding China and giving money uh, to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, I think there are strategic right. reasons which uh, suit their interests as well, right? Yeah, I don't think any, anybody hands out money, you know, for nothing. <laughs> they have no free. <laughs> right. uh, everybody has, has some kind of interest behind it. And China is certainly no different. Yeah, sure. right, right. So, Dr. Kumar Swami, uh, since we are sitting in this region uh, of, let's say, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, how serious do you think uh, is the risk of Pakistan going Sri Lanka's way, knowing that uh, Pakistan has only a few months of uh, foreign exchange reserve left uh, in its own banks. Yeah. So, uh, to be honest, um, I don't have a granular understanding of the Pakistani uh, uh, economy, so I must say that first. Uh, but one observation uh, I can make is that Pakistan went to the IMF much earlier. Uh, so it does have an IMF program in place. Now, whether or not it can keep that program on track uh, seems to be a challenge for them. Um, but usually, as long as the countries are able to maintain an IMF program, they are able to mobilize financing, um, either through bilateral sources or other multilateral sources or even markets. Um, so uh, that is going to be key. If they're able to keep the IMF program on track, 
uh, I suspect they will be able to avoid uh, going, going. Because they already have a program you know, which is in place, which is which is there one step ahead of us. You know. So I'm not sure if uh, people in Colombo are already trying to reach out to you to get you back to some sort of a consulting uh, role, Dr. Kumar Swami. But if you were to advise the new president of Sri Lanka, what are the four <laughs> or five things you'd want him to focus on to get the economy back on track? So there are some very good people in Colombo, you know, who know what to do. So, you know, so they, they just need to be allowed to do it uh, without politicizing economic decision making. Uh, and uh, so let me say, obviously, the first thing is to get a staff level agreement with the IMF. The second thing is uh, to have a clear program in terms of achieving debt sustainability and taking that and uh, negotiating effectively uh, with the creditors. Uh, and here China, you know, histori historically, when it comes to debt restructuring, China has not been easy. So we will need to f find a way of convincing the Chinese to also assist us. Um, and so that's debt restructuring. That's number two. Uh, number three is that we need bridging finance. Uh, because with the, even, even in the most optimistic scenario, mm -hmm. it is going to take, you know, at least three, four months, possibly more. Uh, to get an IMF executive board approval of our program and to trigger all the money that comes in. Because the IMF program is, is, is roughly about a billion a year over three years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we have an IMF full program, uh, I think the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank will give us about a billion each in terms of direct budgetary support. IMF money is balanced payment support. World Bank and ADB will give us budgetary support. So that, and, and, and as I said, other bilateral money will come on stream and maybe a year or 18 months down the line we could have access to markets again mm -hmm. so that opens things up but we have to get through the coming weeks and months uh, uh and, and and that that is going to be the challenge and i think we would you know essentially uh, to do that uh we get, need to get bridging finance and and hopefully get a staff level agreement to help us but that is the story for the next six months right but if we are to make sure that we don't come back to where we are now, two or three years down the line, we have to implement the structural adjustment that we have postponed. You see, in these 16 programs, people say, look, the IMF programs have been a failure. Uh, and certainly the early IMF programs were not often sensitive to the country circumstances. They had a kind of a cookie cutter approach where they just had a, a prescribed Washington consensus as it was. Right. But the IMF has changed significantly now. They are much more concerned about distributional issues. Even the current program, they're talking a lot about the social safety net and the need to protect the vulnerable. So the IMF has changed. So that, that is, uh, we need to make sure that the structural reform which we keep postponing. You know, I was the bank carrier for the Sri Lankan finance minister, mm -hmm. Mr. Ronald now in the 80s. So I used to walk around with him all over the place, listen to all his speeches. I found that the things I was saying when I was in the central bank, uh, you know, 2016, 2019, were exactly the same things he was saying. Right. You know, right. these we know what to do. We know what to do to improve the investment. We know what to do to improve factor markets, the land, labor, and capital markets. We know what to do to improve uh, the the the, the um, uh, trade policy and trade facilitation. We know what we do. We need to do to improve our education, training, and skills development. These are all things that have been known for many years, right. but somehow we haven't been able to get it. So this time around, we have to make sure we get it done. Because there's another reason. Historically, when we went to the IMF, we went when the economy was overheating. So the economy wasn't contracting, it was overheating. That's why we went to the IMF, usually because the fiscal operations pumped money in, created inflation, and, and, and the balance of payments was under pressure. This time, the problems are different because we are going into a, uh, a contractionary program, which an IMF program will be, because it has to be to make, to balance out the imbalances in the economy. If you don't do the structural reforms, the contraction will be far more acute. So the, 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 the destruction of jobs, of incomes, will be much worse than it has been in the past. So it becomes much more important. The premium attached to doing the structural reforms quickly is far greater at this point than in any of the other 16 programs we've had. 
So we have to get these things done. I've given you, you know, in broad headlines of where we need to get this job done. Right. And and people know we need to just get it done. Right. So the other thing, uh, other thing which uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy, uh, Sri Lankan governments have been accused of is not giving the central bank its independence to set uh, monetary policy. So do you think around this time when an IMF bailout comes along and you know there's some sort of agreement, will the uh, multilateral agency insist on greater independence for central bank and will that be part of, let's say, a covenant that you need to agree to? I, I don't know what the conditions of the program are going to be, but I would hope, fervently hope, that the central bank bill uh, that was formulated, uh, you know, in the period leading up to 2019, and which actually got to parliament, but we ran out of parliamentary time. I hope very much that the IMF insists that that bill is revived. It may have to be revised a bit, it's okay. But that bill, which sought to give the central bank more autonomy, needs to be implemented, needs to be enacted. Because I ask myself the question, the tax cuts, the, you know, the unsolicited tax cuts, mm -hmm. which were part of the problem in terms of creating this crisis, an important part, because the, what happened was taxes were cut, four to 600 billion, rupees worth of revenue was lost and it was made up by forcing the central bank to print money that was one of the ways that money was made up and that obviously creates inflation and leaks into the balance of payments so that kind of fiscal forbearance in monetary policy which is this is not the only time by the way this is possibly one of the more uh, egregious uh, um, episodes but it has happened time and again so the central bank bill did a couple of things which are important. One, it was going to prevent the central bank from participating in the primary auctions for treasury bills. Now this is how the high powered money as they call it, mm -hmm. is when the government sells the central bank treasury bills and takes money. You know, the central bank just creates money, almost at will for the government. There was a lot of that that has gone on recent, uh, these last couple of years. And it has gone on before as well, to be fair. So we have to stop that. Right. We can't allow this kind of uh, money printing to carry on. Right. So that, that the central bank bill, which is in parliament, which was in parliament, but which was not taken forward, needs to be revived. And that provision has to come back in. And also it, it had certain, uh, amongst other things, uh, had certain reforms to the governance structure. Because in the current governance structure, there is a monetary board which looks after all the affairs of the central bank, and the secretary of the treasury sits on the monetary board. So there is a clear kind of conflict of interest there. Right. The, the new central bank bill tried to, tried to bifurcate the, the, the governance structure. So there was to be a specialist monetary policy board, mm -hmm. which had only monetary policy specialists, the governor, the deputy governor, and a few monetary policy specialists. And then there was a governance board which was separate, which would look after other matters, which would have representation from the Treasury, the Secretary of the Treasury, as well as other sectors of the economy. So that kind of bifurcation would also give greater autonomy to the monetary policy making of the central bank, which is crucial. Right. Um, you know, the, the, one of the two key objectives of the central bank is monet, uh, um, monetary and uh, uh, economic stability, right? So that, that objective was to get superseded by the government putting pressure on the central bank, basically to print money for its own purposes. So right. that, that link um, through the central bank participating in the primary auctions for treasury bills needs to be broken and broken by law, right. broken and, 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 and embedded in law. So, uh, Dr. Kumar Swami, when I look at the popular uprising that's happening in Sri Lanka right now, people, you know, out on the streets, uh, invading homes of politicians, your rulers, it looks a lot like the Arab Spring to me. Uh, so, in some sense, people are saying that the current crop of politicians that we have in Sri Lanka, we don't trust them anymore. I don't think they're capable of uh, giving us the kind of government we really need. Uh, so, uh, do you think there is 
a possible movement towards a newer set of, maybe a younger set of leaders who will emerge on the scene, who will take Sri Lanka forward from here on? Um, one is, you know, as a, this is uh, something that is above my pay grade. I have scrupulously avoided uh, getting uh, involved in any any politics, particularly given my recent engagement with the central bank. But let me let me just say this in in very general terms. Um, I think we can't have business as usual. The country's political mold has to be broken, whether it is by young people, old people, or middle-aged people, it doesn't matter who, but we can't go on as we were earlier, whereby every aspect of our life is dominated by politics, not just the central bank. Right. Everything is dominated by politics. You know, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the press, whether it's uh, anything and everything is just it's a, it, it, everybody takes it for granted, both the politicians and the people take it for granted that the politicians can dominate everything. That has to change. That mold has to be broken. As I said, doesn't matter who who does it. Uh, I have no interest in who does it, but somebody has to do it because otherwise we will not get out of this this situation. Right. But do you also think? Uh this crisis is going to get Sri Lanka to rethink its geopolitical alignment in the new world order, you know, maybe move away from uh, countries like China, maybe closer towards India, uh, you know, democracy, uh, democracy, both of us are democratic countries. Uh, do you think there'll be some sort of realignment that Sri Lanka does on the foreign policy front as well? Let's just be the last question. I'm sure you, you probably uh, don't want to, uh, you know, speculate too much, but just a general thought on, on, on this issue the, the, yeah the general thought is you know let me first acknowledge that india has played an absolutely crucial role in keeping us afloat without the assistance that india has provided in the last six months you know we would have gone under for sure so that has been absolutely crucial uh, and you know there are civilization i mean you know the links are uh, there are so many True. links between our two countries um so clearly, uh, it's axiomatic that good relations with India has to be uh, at the front and center of our foreign policy. I mean, that's for sure. Um, but beyond that, I, I think we have done best when we've maintained neutrality. Uh, you know, um, I think probably the in my lifetime, the best period of our foreign policy mm -hmm. was when Mrs. Bandaranaike uh, was uh, prime minister. At that time, we, you know, we didn't have an executive president. Um, and the economic policy was completely, in my view, misaligned. But the foreign policy was absolutely right. You know, she had a, not only did the uh, two countries have a very close relationship, but Mrs. Bananaik and Mrs. Gandhi had a very close personal relationship. So much so that, you know, um, during the Bangladesh war, the Pakistani um, Air Force wanted to refuel in Colombo to get across to what was then East Pakistan. And Mrs. Bandaranaika felt that as a non-aligned neutral country that we couldn't say no. We would say, we would give that footage to anybody. So despite the close relation between the two countries, despite her very close relationship with Mrs. Gandhi, she allowed the Pakistani uh, Air Force to refuel in Colombo. But it right. didn't undermine the relationship between our two countries because she was able to manage it so well that she was able to do this. So that is the kind of foreign policy that we need, where we need to be able to operate in a neutral way, but to give confidence to everybody that uh, we, we, you know, that we are neutral, but that, you know, we have to understand that India is our neighbor. India is the uh, regional power. And we have to factor all that in to our external affairs. Right. So, <clears throat> Dr. Kumar Swami, as your neighbors, we uh, obviously express our solidarity and we wish the people of Sri Lanka come out of this uh, situation uh, fairly quickly. And, uh, and, and on that note, let me thank you for joining News9Live.com for this exclusive conversation on Straving Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Kumar Swami. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.